Welcome back to Plenary Session. This is Ash Abstract number three. This is the Ascent Trial, and we're going to talk about it today on this in this video and on this podcast. If you're listening at home, you should check out the video feed. I got some slides. This is presented by Shaji Kumar and colleagues, and listeners of Plenary Session said, you got to take a look at this abstract. You got to watch the presentation, listen to what the speaker said, and provide a commentary on that. I did listen to everything the speaker said, and indeed, I had a lot of problems with what he said. It was very unscientific in my opinion. I'm going to walk you through that on this video today. This is Fixed Duration Therapy with DARA CRD, High Risk Smoldering Myeloma and Uncontrolled Study called the Ascent Trial. Number one problem, there needs to be some rule uh, for who gets to name trials. I mean, if you do an uncontrolled study with a uh, medium sample size, do you really deserve a name like Ascent? I think it's a bit much. It's a bit dramatic. Let's take a look at what happened in this study. This is uh, uncontrolled study. Uncontrolled, that's the key word. There's no control arm. It's just people with high-risk smoldering myeloma. They're brought in for induction with carfilzomib, revlimid, daratumumab, dex. Then consolidation with your favorite, carfilzomib, revlimid, daratumumab, dex. And then maintenance with, of course, lenalidomide and daratumumab. And eventually, eventually, all treatment stops eventually. Eventually, and even here too, it stops. These are, of course, people with an asymptomatic precancerous condition called high-risk smoldering myeloma. It's a condition that we don't have any randomized data that shows treating is preferable to watching. We have a terrible study from the Spanish group that didn't use PET at, in, at entrance and is so underpowered. The OS result is absolutely unreliable and spurious. We have an ECOG study that shows a PFS benefit, but again, was incapable of showing an OS benefit because the authors foolishly crossed everyone over, uh, seeming to forget their pre-specified secondary endpoints. You got this study, an uncontrolled study in smoldering myeloma. These are people who don't need to be treated. That's right. They, they don't need to be treated. There's no proof that they benefit from treatment. And here we're throwing the kitchen sink at them. The only thing I'll give them credit for off the bat is that if you think high-risk smoldering is the equivalent of a mix of myeloma and MGUS, then if you wanted to treat it, at least you'd treat it with something you would normally use in myeloma. But obviously, this is even overkill by myeloma standards. We all know CRD is not better than VRD. We know adding DARA is still unproven. This is just a lot of treatment for a precancerous condition. And why are they doing this? That's the question I come to. Why are they doing this? Trial objectives. The primary endpoint of the study is the rate of confirmed stringent complete response. Remember that. The primary endpoint of the study is the rate of stringent complete response. Secondary endpoints are determined toxicity, PFS, MRD negative, blah, blah, blah. The trial was designed to accrue 83 patients, and it's testing the null hypothesis that the stringent CR rate is 65%, and the alternative hypothesis is what they want, a stringent CR rate of 80%. So that's this study, uncontrolled study, high-risk smoldering myeloma, looking to see if the stringent CR rate is 80%. That's what they're doing. But how do, how does the speaker describe it in the video? He says there are three ongoing cure trials. Cure trials. These are cure trials. They're trials to see if we can cure people. He says, quote, we had, it asked the question, quote, can we maybe cure the patient? Quote, this was designed to explore, can we cure some of these patients? So he keeps saying it's, it's going to cure people. This is a trial to see if it cures. Really? Is that what the trial's about? This is, this is my, my criticism of this presentation. When you deliver an oral presentation to ASK or ASCO or whatever, you have to be a scientist. You have to say things that are justified by the results of your study. You can't just make shit up. You just can't make shit up. I'm sorry. And these statements are making things up. These are not cure trials. These are not trials where you went to the statistician. You said, listen, I want, I got an idea. I got a, a crazy idea. You're going to give me 80 something. You're going to get, you're going to give me some people. I got a treatment. It's going to cure them of a disease. Okay. Um, what kind of sample size do I need? And you know, how do I prove that I cure him? Imagine you go to a statistician and say that. Is the statistician going to say, run this study of 83 people looking at a stringent CR rate of 80%? No. Here's what the statistician is going to say. If I tell my statistician, I want to see if my treatment cures the patient, they're going to say, oh, wow, really? Wow. Poof. That's awfully courageous of you, doctor. Are, are, is myeloma disease known for high cure rates? I, I, actually, I, we've never actually been able to cure anybody. I'm sorry about that. But, you know, I, I want to prove if I can cure. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, I can work with you. I'm a statistician. I can work with you. Um, you know, I'm, as I think about your sample size, you're going to need to enroll X number of patients and treat them. But as I really think, like, how would you prove that it's a cure? I mean, what is the definition of cure? It is after a fixed course of therapy, a group of people experience the comparable survival function as covariate matched controls who don't have the disease of interest. So you take, we'll have to think about it. 
so many people with multiple my- with smoldering myeloma. You give them a fixed course of treatment, which you're doing. And then we need to prove that the people on the back end who get through your fixed course of treatment have the same survival function as covariate matched controls. That's the definition of cure. Eason Russell, 1960s. It's always been the definition. It's the definition that makes sense to people that after a fixed course of therapy, you'll live life as if you didn't have the disease. That's what an, it's an average person intuits about cure. So <clears throat> how are you going to prove it? Well, first, you're going to have to have a sense of the covariate match control survival function. Since these are people in their 60s, they're probably going to be pretty, pretty good. I mean, their 10-year survival will be very high in the 90 percentage points. And, and I guess you're going to want to prove in your cohort that you have a comparable survival to that function and you're probably going to use a non-inferiority design and you're going to need a really, really tight margin, like no worse than 1% per year or even half a percent per year decrement in overall survival. In other words, if we expect that 94% of these people will be alive 10 years later, 92%, you're going to want to show that you are no worse than 90% survival of 10 years to really prove a cure. And so let me help you here with my calculator. I'm a statistician. The sample size of the study is going to be really, really massive. It's going to be a massive study, a massive undertaking. And then the first thing the statistician is going to say when he actually tells you this, he's going to say, you know, it'll probably just as a first step, a little modesty, wouldn't it just be easier to show that by treating these people who don't need to be treated with all these drugs, they don't need just to show that they have a better overall survival than just if you hadn't treated them at all? which is what the standard of care is. So just do a randomized study and just show an OS benefit. Wouldn't that be a little easier first step before we run this mega trial looking to show that you actually are curing these people? Wouldn't that be easy? And then you say, no, I want to show that we are curing these people, but I only want to enroll 80 people. Help me do that. And then they're going to say, I don't know, maybe use a stringent CR rate of 80%, but also you shouldn't go around telling people that you're doing a cure trial. And that's the issue here. Okay, that's the rub. He shouldn't go around telling people he's doing a cure trial. He's not doing a cure trial. He's not proving that he's going to cure anybody. That's empty rhetoric. It's not scientific. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. The trial is not studying that. It's an uncontrolled study of a population that doesn't need treatment, that no one has ever proven that they have a survival benefit from treating them in a properly done phase three study. Never shown that. Don't even talk to me about the Spanish study. I've covered that in many videos. It's totally unreliable. No one has ever shown that they even benefit from treatment. And you're going to power your study for stringent CR rate. You're not going to be able to assess cure. You should get. You should take that word and throw it away. You don't know what you're saying when you say that word. And by using that language, you're misleading. Okay? So you're doing an uncontrolled study that frankly is, number one, unable to answer an interesting clinical question. Because to me, I'm not interested in what the response rate is going to be in a population that uh, giving the same drugs that have some response rate in the in the actual cancer setting. Of course, you're going to have some response rate. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in like, do they actually live longer, live better by virtue of early treatment? Since you can't answer that question, your trial is incapable of answering a useful clinical question. And as such, it is by definition unethical. Because an ethical trial has to have a prerequisite is asking a useful clinical question. Taking drugs that are active in myeloma and testing and smoldering and looking at response rate is not a useful thing. There's no use to it. In fact, if someone even dies on treatment, you worry that you may have actually killed people. I mean, you don't know because you have no control on it. So it doesn't even protect the participants. It's egregiously unethical. IRBs need to halt every single uncontrolled study of smoldering myeloma. And they also need to stop letting people say that they're doing cure trials. I don't know what that even means. If you actually went to statistician and tried to beef together a cure trial, sample size is going to be so big it makes your head spin. You're going to wish you do a randomized trial looking at OS benefit. Let's talk about the trial status. 87 people were enrolled between July 2018 and November 2021 from 10 centers. Oh, wow, that huge sample size to prove cure. 87. Yeah, sure, sure. The median follow-up was 26 months. 48 patients have completed all 24 cycles. The median number of cycles of administered was 23. 12 people went off study prior to completion of 24 cycles due to withdrawal by the subject. That's pretty bad. You took somebody who wasn't feeling bad because they have an asymptomatic condition and now they feel so bad. They're withdrawing adverse events, physician decision, progression, and death. Oh, that's mm, not good that you've got a death on your hands. Physician decision. Why would a physician decide to pull the plug on this trial? Doesn't sound good to me either. Response. Remember, 80% of people had have stringent CR. That's the primary endpoint of the study. And lo and behold, the best overall response rate was 97% at a VGPR or better. But that wasn't the primary endpoint, was it? It was stringent CR, which is shown in the blue quadrant, which is shown as 38%. Oh, your null hypothesis 
was a stringent CR rate of 60 some percent, 65 percent. Your alternative hypothesis, what you hoped for, was a stringent CR rate of 80 percent. And what you got was a pitiful 38 percent stringent CR. So in other words, your cure trial failed to achieve the primary endpoint. Let me say that again. Your trial that's looking at cure, cure, failed to achieve the primary endpoint of the study. Failed to achieve the primary endpoint of the study. Those are words that were never said. Failed to meet the stringent CR endpoint. It's a failed study. Failed is a word the speaker doesn't say. That's the only word the speaker should be saying. This is a failed study. We ran a very small, useless, unhelpful phase two study. We keep talking about cure, but we're using words we don't know what we're talking about because we actually won't be able to assess cure. Let's say you treated 87 people and let's say, I don't know, 85. Well, actually, we, we know that so many people can't get through treatment anyway. Let's just say 80 people get through treatment or something or 75. Now, let's say in 10 years, you know, 87% of them are alive. Well, did you cure them? Uh, well, is the survival function comparable to covariate matched people? The confidence intervals are going to be so big so big that you'll have no confidence that you're within a 1%, 5%, 10%. You could be 25 percentage points lower. You have no confidence because your confidence will be massive. You're not running a cure trial. You're using that word, but you're not doing that. You're running a useless uncontrolled study. That's the word you should be using. In fact, what you should be saying is a, a failed uncontrolled study because you set a bar of stringent CR. You're not even close. You're not even close. You're not even half, halfway there. What are you doing? Survival. Four patients progressed in the PFS cohort. PFS rate was blah, blah, blah. Three progressions. One patient developed plasma cell leukemia six months after completing therapy. There's your PFS curve. Again, the confidence interval even here is broad and, if, and, and, and absolutely no ability to tell if we've cured anybody. Adverse events. Any great toxicity was observed in 92% of people. It's a terrible proposition. I don't even know if they benefit from treatment. And now you're saying 92% of them are suffering toxicity. 20% have grade three or higher hematologic toxicity. Non-hematologic toxicity in grade three or higher is in 50% of people. Dose reductions were required for carfilzomib, len, and dex. You're just giving people drugs. You have no rationale for your primary endpoint, stringent CR. You're not even close. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What is this? Why are you calling it a cure trial? What are you doing? Adverse events. There were four deaths, two related to COVID. One RSV, one patient died off therapy due to disease progression. You start to worry if you're actually accelerating death. Your cure trial may even be accelerating death. You don't even know. You have no clue. You have no control arm. What are you doing? What are you doing? Cure. Absolutely not. This person says that cure will be like if 10 years later, if there's a fraction of people who are MRD negative and they live their lifespine without having to deal with myeloma, that might be a cure. Again, the confidence interval is going to be so broad because whatever fraction that is is going to be like 60 people or less. You're going to have no confidence that their lifespan is actually the same as it otherwise would be. It could be massively worse. And so I cite my paper here, Use of the Word Cure in Oncology Literature, which is an analysis we did in 2014 uh, when I was a fellow. And it just basically shows that people use that word. They don't know what they're talking about. All right. What are my overall takeaway here? The ascent trial is uh, a negative study. The primary endpoint of the steroid study was this 80% stringent CR rate. The authors have 38% stringent CR rate. They failed to achieve the primary endpoint of the study. Fail is a word that they need to be saying frequently in their presentation. They don't say that word. They say the word cure at least four times, five times more often than they say fail. That's a problem. They're not running a cure trial. None of these are cure trials. These are a group of people who are swallowed up by groupthink. Their groupthink tells them that drugs that cannot cure myeloma might magically cure smoldering myeloma if you give them early. They have no scientific basis for that claim. All available data suggests that that's unlikely to be the case, that you're not gonna be able to cure, if the drugs don't cure them when they have de novo myeloma, the drugs don't cure them when they meet slim crab criteria, the drugs aren't gonna cure them when they're just shy of slim crab criteria with high-risk smoldering myeloma. There is an important scientific question, which is in this asymptomatic precancerous condition, do people derive a survival benefit by early treatment versus delayed treatment? They have failed to answer that repeatedly. The Spanish study did not perform PET-CT on entry, did not provide Revlimid to the control arm upon progression and satisfactory numbers, and is an underpowered study of which overall survival is not the primary endpoint, and that endpoint result is extremely unreliable. It's so unreliable, it's reminiscent of the drug Olertimab or Lartruvo, 
which came to market on the basis of a similar phase two study uh, that had an OS benefit, but in the phase three study, there was no OS benefit. So that Spanish trial has zero value. The ECOG study was sufficiently, I think, powered to actually be able to say something about overall survival. But when they saw a PFS signal, they immediately crossed everyone over and perverted their entire study. They presented that at a conference. They haven't yet published that fact about their study anywhere that I can find. That makes that study quite useless. It's no longer able to tell us if it's better to take Revlimid versus nothing. Now they're doing DARA CRD in an uncontrolled study. They keep using the word cure. They're not capable of running a cure study. They, statistician, if they were actually told this ridiculous idea, would have counseled them that at least maybe just do DARA CRD versus observation and eke out an OS benefit. That's probably the simplest thing you could show as a first step. They didn't do that either. They have no control arm. They got four people dead. They got some people dead of COVID. We don't know that they would have died of COVID if they weren't on this study. Very likely their COVID death was partly accelerated by being on a fistful of medications that may suppress their immune system. So in fact, if anything, DARA CRD could be a, not a curative regimen, but a murderous regimen. It could kill people. They have no ability to, to separate the two. The speaker has not acknowledged any of the limitations of the study. The speaker is living in a fairy tale world where he's running a trial that's trying to prove unicorns and pegasus and cures, uh, but it has no way able to do any of those things. Uh, the rhetoric is unacceptable. It's unhelpful. It's harmful. They are all chatting amongst themselves in their little bubble where they think that a series of uncontrolled phase two studies, the speaker in fact calls for more, are going to be useful someday. They're never going to be useful. They're always useless. They can't answer a useful clinical question. And they are by definition unethical and they should be halted by IRBs. This is the problem with groupthink. You need to involve people in your trials who disagree with you. You need to bring people who are critics and invite them to the table and not oncology critics, which are basically people who also take money from the same companies and, you know, just play act for debates. I'm talking about people who really sincerely disagree with you. And if you're unwilling to hear their voices, you end up fueling your delusion and you actually get on stage and say several times that you're running a cure trial when anyone with an ounce of sense knows that you're not doing any such thing. You're running a trial that's a failed study. It's failed. It failed to achieve the primary endpoint of stringent CR rate, which is a useless primary endpoint because if you take drugs that are active later and give them earlier, of course, you're going to have some response. What do I care what it is? The question is, do they live longer, live better as a result? It's an abandonment to myeloma patients. Myeloma patients are being squandered by participating in this study. I think uh, it's terrible all around. Uh, so absolutely awful presentation. Uh, the Q&A was also, you know, people don't ask the legitimate question, which is how would you actually prove cure? What happened when you told the statistician you're running a cure trial? Did they laugh at you? Because that's probably what they would do when they see your sample size. And why are you not saying that you failed to achieve the primary endpoint of the study, which is the first thing you should say. So bad all around, emblematic of some of the deep problems in oncology, the rot, not all financial rot. Some of it is cognitive rot and, uh, and uh, intellectual rot. I mean, they're just so punch drunk on this idea. They're going to cure high-risk smoldering. I I'll tell you. If, you, if you're going to cure high-risk smoldering, I bet those drugs will cure some people with actual de novo myeloma, especially with slim crab criteria, which is essentially high-risk smoldering, by the way. Slim crab criteria is not even myeloma. It's high-risk smoldering. You just renamed it. <laughs> that's, your, that's what you did. I mean, you didn't really prove that they benefit from treatment either. And these drugs are not going to cure myeloma. You need fundamentally different strategies and different drugs. And you're not running cure trials. Just start by showing survival benefits over observation. That's the easiest thing you can do. And then... Once you do that, then run a cure trial, a huge uncontrolled study with covariate match controls and a very tight non-inferior margin, probably like one-tenth of 1% 1 per year or half a percent per year or something like that. Okay, those are my thoughts. Ascent trial, garbage, it should be called descent. It's a descent into both ethical and intellectual bankruptcy. Until next time.